Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Lisa will be along shortly. She's just running a little bit behind. Before we start, <clears throat> I just want to say a few words in memory of our friend and colleague, uh, Rudy Stuck, who passed away last Thursday. A valuable source of advice and guidance in the committee's planning matters. He was active in the Norfolk County uh, farming community for well over 40 years, holding various positions with several agricultural organizations. And our sincerest condolences go out to Rudy's family and friends. Thank you. So we'll begin the meeting for June. And for everyone's information, we will generally deal with each application according to the order of the agenda. Extra copies are available on the back table. Uh, the committee will make their decision. Oh, extra copy. Uh, anyone present who wishes to speak in support or against an application, as well as anyone with questions or concerns, will have an opportunity to speak. The committee will make their decision following each application. If there is anyone present who is not an applicant, or an agent, but is interested in the decision of the committee, you may file your interest with our secretary treasurer. Please list the file number, your full name and mailing address. Copies of the decisions are automatically sent to the applicant and agent within 15 days of the meeting. Only the applicant, the minister or specified a specified person or any public body may appeal the may appeal decisions in respect to the applications for consent or minor variances to the Ontario Land Tribunal. The decisions are final if there are no appeals 20 days after the committee's decision. May I please remind everyone that we're being recorded and live streamed and to mute your phones for the time being, as well as if you wish to speak to an application, please make sure you make your way to the podium. Be sure the mic is on, state your first and last name for the record. The first order of business is to determine if any members have any disclosures of interest when considering any of the applications that we will be dealing with today. Are there any disclosures of interest? Seeing none, have all the members received the minutes from the previous meeting? meeting? Are there any errors or omissions? Seeing none, uh, before me I have a resolution. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Tim, seconded by Phil. And the result of the meeting, the minutes of the meeting, the committee of adjustment held Wednesday, May the 17th, be adopted as circulated. All in favor? That is carried. Our first application to be considered is a minor variance file number. ANPL 202-202-3058 in the name of Peter and Linda White and the planner can give the report, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so an application has been received to construct a detached accessory dwelling unit. Uh, sorry, detached additional residential dwelling unit, requiring a leaf of 43 square meters for the maximum permitted usable floor area of 75 square meters to permit a usable floor area of 118 square meters and 3.8 meters from the maximum height of an accessory building of 5 meters to permit a total height of 8.8 meters. Uh, so, for context, the official plan has the new property designated as agricultural as, and the zoning bylaw um, roughly zoned agricultural as well. Uh, the subject lands are located to the southeast intersection of Wendell Road 7 and Highway 24. Um, the area of the property is about 13 acres. For the, so the proposal is to convert the existing structure um, to have an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, there's a component for storage that is wholly separate from the proposed ADU and the separation is maintained. Uh, by ensuring that there's no shared access between the ADU and the storage. So as a result of this, the structure will meet the maximum for 200 square meter requirement for accessory structures, but will require relief of 43 square meters from the maximum permitted usable floor area of 75 square meters for the detached ADU. Uh, if there's should access be between the accessory building and the dwelling unit in the future, the ADU may not meet zoning provisions regarding maximum equal floor area. 
So the effect of the requested relief from height will permit the ADU to have a height of 8.8 .8 meters, which is roughly 28 feet, and the detached accessory structure without the dwelling spaces are permitted to be 8 meters in height in the agricultural zone. So due to the rural character of the surrounding lands, it's staff's opinion uh, that the requested relief for height is that can be considered relatively minor. And further, that staff recognized that the existing building creates constraints on how height can be approached practically. So staff's opinion is that the application meets the four tests of the minor variance and right under the Okay, thank you. Is the is there an applicant or agent in attendance? Okay. Um, does the committee have any questions for the for the planner? No. Uh, does the agent or applicant have anything to add? No. Okay. Does the committee have any? Oh. Is there anyone present that wishes to speak to this application? Come forward now and state your name. No. Okay. Um, anything else from the committee? Can I get a motion from the committee? Tim, Tim moves approval. Seconded. Linda. File number AMPL 2023058. I named Peter and Linda White. In accordance with Section 45 1 of the Planning Act, the requested relief is considered appropriate for the Proposed development, minor in nature, and maintains the general intent of the official plan and the zoning bylaw. All in favor? That is carried. Next up is file number AMPL 2023-0108. In the name of Lori Ann Rogers and the applicant, can, uh, the planner can give the report, please. B3, Mr. Chair. So, an application has been received to construct a sunroom requiring a leaf of 2.12 meters from a minimum rear yard setback of 6 meters to permit a decreased rear yard setback of 3.88 meters and relief of 0 0.2 meters from the left interior side yard setback of 1.2 meters to permit a decreased interior side yard setback of 1.02 meters. So the subject lands is designated urban residential in the official plan and is zoned urban residential type 4, R4, in the zoning bylaw. Uh, so the area of the subject lands is about 250 square meters and is occupied by a townhouse with an existing rear and concrete deck. The application seeks to expand an existing townhouse dwelling by enclosing an existing rear deck, therefore converting it to a sunroom, and a sunroom is understood to be an extension of the main dwelling. A site plan waiver application has been submitted with the building elevation drawings that have been reviewed by staff. Uh, given the scale of the sunroom, it's staff's opinion that this is a low impact to the existing building size and usability. Therefore, the sunroom does not meet the definition of development per section 41 of the Planning Act. And as a result, the site plan waiver has the site plan application has been waived. And in summary, it is the professional opinion of staff that the proposed development meets the four tests of the minor variance recommended for approval. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there an agent or applicant present? No? Okay. Anything from the committee that questions to the planner? No. Um, can I get a motion from the committee, please? Second, Tim. File number AMPL 2023108, in the name of Laurie Ann Rogers. In accordance with Section 45 1 of the Planning Act, a requested relief is considered appropriate for the Proposed development, minor in nature, maintains a general intent of the official plan and the zoning bylaw. All in favor? That's carried. Next up is file number ANPL 
132 in the name of Jose and Brenda Nalo. Planner can give you work, please. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. An application has been received to construct a sunroom requiring relief of 2.12 meters from the minimum rear yard setback of 6 meters to permit a decreased rear yard setback of 3.88 meters and relief of 0 0.4 meters from the right interior side yard setback for a setback of 0 0.8 meters. Um, this is basically down the road of the field from the last one. Uh, so the urban, sorry, the official plan designation is the same. Uh, it's designated urban residential and it's zoned urban residential type four. Um, so due to the considerations discussed in the earlier file, uh, there's no anticipated impact on common element at the rear um, or the existing side and setbacks for the interior and rear lot lines, as well as the neighbors reasonable enjoyment of the private space. Planning staff are the opinion that the proposed development meets the four test of minor bearings and that other for approval. Thank you. I expect an influx of these uh, applications in the next six months. Not every neighbor is going to want one. Is there an agent or applicant present for this application? Yeah, OK, we'll get. Um, anything from the committee to the planner? Do you have anything to add? OK, uh, can I get a motion from the committee? Oh, is there anyone present who wishes to speak for or against this application? Hearing none, can I get a motion from the committee? Bill? Seconded by Linda. File number ANPL 2023132, the name of Jose Brenda Melo. In accordance with Section 45 1 of the Planning Act, the requested relief is considered appropriate for the proposed development, minor in nature, and maintains the general intent of the official plan and the zoning bylaw. All in favor? That's carrying. So next up we have file number BNPL 2023133 in the name of David and Beverly Peacock. And the planner can give the report, please. For you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the next two files are uh, 5.4 and 5.5. They're actually together. So if it's okay, can I can have them together at the same time. Oh. Correct. Yeah, so 133 and 134. Okay, so um, for 133. An application has been received to separate parcel having a frontage of 34, roughly 35 meters, an irregular width of uh, in between 34 and 37 meters, an irregular depth between 42 and 43 meters, and having an area of just over 1,500 square meters uh, to retain a parcel having an area of 36 hectares or 89 acres as the creation of a lot in the urban area of Simcoe. An application has also been received to create an easement with a frontage of five meters and a width of five meters for a total area of 215 square meters for the purposes of a hydro line. Um, for so, the proposal summary for 133, 133 essentially has a house, and the proposal for BNPL 2023 134 is currently vacant. Uh, for BNPL 2023-134, an application has been received to sever a parcel having a frontage of 30 meters, an irregular width of, of between 27 and 30 meters, and an irregular depth of between 43 and 45 meters, having an area just under 1,300 square meters, and to retain a parcel having an area of 36.28 hectares as the creation of a lot in the urban area of Simcoe. Uh, so for context, the subject lands is designated urban residential and is zoned urban residential type two, so R2, as well as development zone. So the subject lands are located at the northeast intersection of 14th Street and Norfolk Street North. The area is approximately 90 acres with roughly 23 meters of frontage expected to be retained on Norfolk Street North on Highway 24. Um, so planning for this file, a plan justification report was included with the submission and is listed as attachment to the appendix. Um, so the subject lands were previously subject to severance files BNPL 2020 004, which is lapsed, 
and 2020-005, for which a certificate of decision was granted, <clears throat> which now possesses civic address 941 Civic Norfolk County Road North. Um, additionally, relevant to this application is an anticipated extension of municipal service in the area as part of the inner urban water supply project. Attachment 4 is a notice of completion for the <clears throat> Simcoe Townsend water supply system, uh, which provides a map of the project area. Um, so, <clears throat> for recognizing section 9.6.3.2, the unique and the unique context of the property uh, to, for reference, there are no municipal services available in this area of Simcoe, which is designated urban area. The urban areas are intended to be where growth, development, infill and intensification occur. Municipal services are expected to be extended through the interurban water supply project. And that currently a lack of municipal servicing inhibits the immediate development potential of a larger subdivision. Recognizing the choice to develop two lots today may limit the subdivision's potential in the future when services become available. It's the professional opinion of staff that the proposed development meets the intent and purpose of the official plan and zoning bylaw and the recommended approval subject to the attached conditions for both applications. Is there an agent or an applicant present, Mike? Okay, we'll get to you, Mike. Just, I'll get to you in a second. OK, um, anything from the committee to the planner? Anything to add? Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee. Uh, we're supportive of the staff's position, obviously, on both applications and just wanted to provide some clarity on some of the conditions and discuss the conditions. There might be a few conditions in my view that are not necessary for the application, but that's what we want to discuss. So if I may discuss the farmhouse first, that's the northern of the two lots that's being severed. That's 133, yes, correct. I will reach the conditions on this. So I have no issue with um, with one and two. Number three is, I guess, the focus of my concern. It notes a geotechnical report. I don't think that's actually correct. I think they meant. I think they may have meant hydrogeological study to look at the groundwater to look make sure the septic is appropriate for that site. I just want to get clarification on that. But further to that, the application, the lot size does meet county policy. We we designed it to meet county policy and. As such, I would respectfully suggest that number three is not relevant to this application, not necessary. It could be if the committee wished to rewrite it to say that a septic designer would, would have to design the septic to, to uh, surface that, that house once, it, once it's created. There's already a house there. There was a septic assessment undertaken. There was a cesspool that was identified on the property. Since then, there has been a septic, septic a tile field identified. Condition of it, I don't know. And if it functions, I don't know. But it would mean as part of that, they'd have to get another assessment undertaken to determine what type of a new septic system would be permitted. That covers that, yes. Okay, so just before you can go on to the next one, we'll just get staff to comment on that. Thank you. So, uh, three you, Mr. Chair. So, a geotechnical report would essentially determine the appropriate lot size that could be supported for the septic system. With respect, no. That's a hydrogeological report, which talks about uh, subsurface groundwater flowing to make sure that, the that any affluent would would meet provincial standards when it hits the law line, theoretically. A geo, and correct me if I'm wrong, a geotechnical report would look to make sure the base of the land itself has the structure to accommodate and can accommodate building. There's no actual building proposed here. Right, but theoretically there would be a building being proposed at a later date, would there not be? Okay, so just 
there's there's a house already on the property. There's an outbuilding already in the property. We're looking to sever that off. So there's no actual construction that occurs. We're looking at the septic system at this point. The septic system, in my experience, and I may, may differ from yours and from the counties, uh, it's, it's a hydrogeological study that would, would size the septic system appropriately to determine what's needed. In this case, there's already one. There's, I suppose, for the house exists, a septic designer, in my, in my view, would work with county building to ensure that the septic is designed properly and adequately for the, for the house. I just I see that identified under number six. I, I don't see it being required in number number three. I guess is what I'm trying to get to. I don't want my clients to go through extra work for no purpose. Um, so look, just let me interject here. You're suggesting that we um, substitute the geotechnical, the hydro. Um, Hydrogeological. Hydrogeological. <laughs> it's a mouthful, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. I'm actually suggesting that this condition be be rewritten so that that study is not required. So the septic gets picked up again down and uh... correct. And I have some suggestions for that for that language of number six, but all my comments are related okay, to the septic well, system. We'll get to that. All right. So we'll just finish this one up first. Mohammed, go ahead. So, Mr. Chair, um, so these requirements are actually come from the engineering. Uh, I do agree with uh, um, with uh, Mr. Slovan that the geotechnical is generally related to the building structure and the building condition and building uh, construction. Uh, it would be more appropriate to have a hydrogeological, um, but it also related to the with the condition six, which uh, states that for the savers land, a class one on such switch system will not support a single family dwelling. A building permit is required for a new class four on such switch system. So there will be further work needs to be done um, through these conditions and a hydrogeological will also support that condition. So my interpretation is uh, we still need a hydrogeological. Um, as condition three. So in other words, just substitute the geo, the hydrogeological from the geological, geotechnical. Sorry, was that a correct? So Mr. Chair, it's correct. Okay. Um, so then again, the um, the septic would be fully assessed. In number six, and if it was deemed unfit, you'd have to go from there, right, to get a building permit. That would be correct. Nothing get past it. Uh, you'd have to get a, a permit for the to install the septic system, and that would be done by a qualified septic sure. designer. That's my only. But to get to that point, you have to assess it to see what kind of condition it is. A full assessment of the of the septic to get to that point to whether you can use it or not use it. It, it has had well, with cesspool. It has been assessed. It obviously doesn't work, right? In my view and my understanding, the other septic system I think just confuses matters. I think what what I would suggest for the county's uh, for the community's benefit is just go with a new septic system. That's what I'm. That would be a. And that's system. covered off in number six anyway. Correct. Right? Okay. So I think what we'll do if the committee has the committee got any questions, Linda. Okay. Okay. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> uh, actually, no. In this in this case, there aren't. Thank you. Okay. So, just to be clear, uh, Mr. Sullivan, you're you would be fine with the substituting of that word, the hide, removing the geotechnical and. Replacing it with a hydro. <laughs> that hydro word. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really to the, to the septic system design. Mr. Chair, with full respect, and uh, Mr. Allen and I may have, may have uh, I guess, different positions on this. I don't see the need for hydrogeological study. 
it's going to we know the new subject is is in my experience a hydrogeological study decides the size of the of the lot to determine the size of the septic system right in this case i don't see the need for that study i see a need for a designer to go out and put a new septic system in whatever size is needed for that property okay linda I'm just going to ask you to clarify. Uh, you mentioned condition six. What does that actually say? Mr. Chair, I've read the report, but I don't well, have. That's the one that. Uh, uh, class one on site sewage system will not support a single family dwelling. A building permit is required for a new class four sewage system. So. Um, again, you'd have to have a, a design done and. Starting from scratch more or less. Right, and, and Mr. Chair, I believe Essex Technologies, who did the the who completed the OSSD form for the county, they confirmed that the existing septic, that the property is not sufficient to to uh, class one system won't work in this case. So class four, which is just a I call it a high tech system, yeah. would work. So to my to my understanding, the only difference between three and six is that there's a hydro D study required, which I don't I think is is redundant. Okay, I'm going to move to remove condition three altogether. So, um, okay, so let's finish. Um, anybody else? Is there? Uh, so you're speaking for the uh, the applicant. Uh, let me go through the formalities here, Mr. Sullivan. Is there any one present that wishes to speak to this application? Come forward now. OK, no. So can I get to, is there anything else from the committee? Can I get a motion? So Linda is moving. Yeah, so the first motion is to to amend the to amend the conditions to remove condition three. OK, and a seconder, please. Kim. Mr. Chair, would it be advisable to bring it back to staff? have a general discussion and bring it back for final decision, I guess. You know, Mr. Chair, if you permit, um, again, these conditions are given by engineering, so without the benefit of getting their comments, um, I see that is problematic, so I would also recommend to get back this to the staff to review if these conditions can be removed. I'm still moving to remove condition three. Okay, sorry, Krishna, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was having some technical issues, so wasn't able to uh, to connect earlier. I apologize for that. Um, I just heard the motion to remove a technical condition uh, from the condition list. I, d I did not hear the earlier version of, of what the discussion was, but would like to caution committee based on the training that the committee had earlier in terms of removal of technical conditions and would suggest that if that was the, the preferred methodology, that it be referred back to staff prior to removing the condition. Okay, thank you. Uh, Linda? I agree um, with Trisha's comments that we would be cautious in removing conditions, but with regards to this particular condition, the building is already there and the septic system is the issue, which is covered under condition number six. So referring it back to staff would 
delay the application. And I'll just further ask the agent if um, if we delay the application, is that a hardship to your client? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the committee. I I understand my client is in, is in poor health at the moment and failing, so I know that she wants to wrap this up. It's been four years it's been going on in, in her mind, so there would be a hardship to her. And what I was going to say, if I'll, I'll leave it there, Ashley. Thank you. Okay. okay, I feel strongly that in this instance, um, the removal of that condition is not a pro not problematic with okay. this application. <laughs> and um, but I will mention to the agent that I'm sure you were aware of these conditions prior to this meeting, and perhaps you could have dealt with this sooner. Mr. Chair, I, I did I did try to contact uh, staff and was unable. Okay. Um, all right. So we have a motion on the floor um, to um, approve this application as amended with the removal of condition number three. Uh, all those in favor, Tim. Yes. So I'm going to vote against. So anyway, it's still carried. Now the other one we have here piggybacks on this application, this original application. Does the planner have anything to add to that? No. Does the applicant have anything to add to that? Uh, Mr. Chair, it would be similar to the previous previous note, except there is no condition six on this that would require a new subject. This is a vacant lot, and I don't see the, and perhaps staff, Mr. Ellen, uh, would have some comments, I think, to a new septic system is required. This lot meets county standards for lot size in the urban area, and a building permit, a septic system will be designed at the time of the building, form, building permit. So the sizing will happen at that time. I'm, I'm just concerned about getting the current owner to the, to requiring a hydro G study when they don't know when and if a house will be built on that property. So in this one, condition number three does, does not refer to a hydro G. Hydrotechnical study. It's the same, the geotechnical versus the geotechnical, <laughs> but there's no building on the lot at this time. That's correct. And the lot is designed per. So there's two scenarios that could happen, Mr. Chair. One is that a house is is built before the water supply reaches the property, at which time building department would require a well and a septic system to be installed. The other scenario is that it waits until the water supply is available. And the lot is fully serviced at that point. There's no need; it's just hooking up to the city, to the county supply. Okay. Staff does anything to add to it? So, Mr. Chair, this is the same reason for um for the for this lot. So, the my comments would be same as people. Thank you. Uh, anything from the committee? I'm just going to say in this situation, it's different. It's a vacant lot, so. Um, I would suggest we either approve it as it is, or we can refer it back. Um, to staff, if you would prefer that to discuss the need for that study. So. <laughs> Mr. Chair, the only only issue with that is it would take it would take the additional time. I understand where the, where the members coming from. I certainly understand that position. I don't want to delay this any longer. So if if we have to work with staff to confirm that this study is required or is not, then they would be required to provide an email signing off as, as a condition, I guess. What I'm trying to say is I don't want to fight. I don't want to argue about it. I just am putting forth my my opinion and the committee can make a decision from there. OK, uh, is there anyone present that wishes to speak to this application for or against the game? Forward. 
Nobody. Anything further from the committee? What are the wishes of the committee? I'll just ask a question to planning staff. If we approve it with that condition there and the engineering staff works with the agent and decides that they don't need the geotechnical study, they can sign off on that. Is that correct? Sign off on the fact that they don't need. Right. So I'm respectfully I'm under the opinion that staff have approved it. Or sorry, staff have reviewed it and therefore they've required it. Um, it's obviously possible that through conversations determined that yes, it's not required. But I have a personal opinion that it's already been reviewed and they've already indicated that we'll need that. So. I get a motion from the committee. I'll move to approve. Second. So file number so we're, we're going to approve this as it is with the commissions that are on. OK, that's fine. So we're clear. Uh, file number BNPL 2023134, the name of David and Beverly Peacock. The application is consistent with the provincial policy statement, complies with the policies of the Norfolk County official plan regarding the creation of a lot within an urban boundary, urban area rather, and meets the intent of the zoning bylaw. All those in favor, Tim? Yes. And Linda? Yes. Phil? Oh, that is carried. Thank you. Welcome, Lisa. <laughs> OK, so next up we have file number BNPL 2023136. Brew Farms, Norfolk Inc. Care of Joyce Brew, and the planner can give the report, please. Thank you for you, Mr. Chair. An application has been received to sever a parcel having a frontage of 56 meters, a width of 56 meters, and a depth of 62 meters, having a total acre size of uh, just under 3,500 square meters, and retain a parcel having an area of just under 150 acres as the severance of the dwelling makes their blessed through farm amalgamation. Uh, so a, as part of the process, a consent application is being reviewed concurrently with the so with a zoning bylaw amendment for the retained lands to remove the single detached dwelling as a permit use in the agricultural zone. So the subject lands are located uh, east of the intersection of Wendell Road 19 and Burford Del High Town Line Road. The area of the property is about the total 150 acres occupied by a same detached dwelling, small shed, a bike storage structure, a dog run, two barns, and two outbuildings. And there is shared access between these severed and retained lands. Uh, site visits by staff determined the following items not captured in the original application. Uh, that's two additional accessory structures on the lot to be severed, um, which can be seen in figure one. A hydroelectric service line from the pole that's located on the retained lands providing service to the single detached dwelling and uh, to be separate from the farm buildings on the retained lands uh, as shown in figure two and a livestock facility located to the east at 298 Milford Del High Road. Uh, staff have identified these items to the agent who provided MDS calculations, uh, which is in attachment three and a revised concept plan in attachment four. Uh, planning staff note that the comments in the mapping received by department staff are based on the original application and concept plan and have not reviewed the additional site specific considerations noted above. Planning staff thank the agent and the owner for working collaboratively to review the conditions of approval, which have been added to reflect the new information discovered at site visit to meet the intent of policy and protect the county interests. In summary, it's the professional opinion of staff that the conditions are satisfied provided that these conditions are satisfied, proposed development meets the overall intent and purpose of the official of DPPS, the official plan and the zoning bylaw and recommend for approval. Um, I just want to get a, ahead if there's a potential discussion on the living conditions. Um, condition 12 has been confirmed by development engineering that it can be removed. Can be removed. 
And with that, I close the uh, presentation there. So just for those who don't have them in front of you, receipt uh, condition 12 is receipt of three copies of the registered reference plan for the several part severed parcel of land from the solicitor acting in the transfer and development engineering is okay with removing this work there. Okay, thank you. Is there an applicant or agent present? Okay, a second, we'll get to you. Uh, is, does the committee have any questions of the planner? And does the applicant or agent have anything to add? Mr. Chair, uh, I'd just like to firstly thank st planning staff for working collaboratively uh, together. We're supportive of staff's recommendation. Uh, I just wanted to confirm that the condition number 12 is actually as it relates to the entrance permit and installation of an entrance required for the retained parcel. Well, that's correct. So my 12 says something different. So my 12 says see the three copies of the registered reference plan for the severed parcel of land from the solicitor acting in the transfer. It should be in regards to the entrance permit. There's the power of this order. Unless, unless it's already been removed. Okay, okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay. All right. Perfect. Good. Okay. My 12 is different than your 12. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. OK, is there anyone present that wishes to speak to this application? Hearing none, is there anything else from the, from the committee? Can I get a motion from the committee, please? Bill? Seconder? Lisa? So file number BNPL 2023136, in the name of Brew Farms, Norfolk Inc. Care of Joyce Brew. The application is consistent with the provincial policy statement, complies with the policy of the Norfolk County official plan regarding the creation of a lot within an agricultural area and meets the intent of the zoning bylaw. All those in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. So file number next up is file number AMPL 2023040, the name of Jacob Reese. And the planner can give the report, please. Thank you. Through the chair, an application has been received to construct a 30 by 60 foot accessory structure requesting relief of 85 square meters in usable floor area from the maximum permitted usable floor area of 100 square meters. To permit a garage with a usable floor area of 167 square meters for the proposed building, plus 18 square meters for an existing structure, bringing the total uh, usable floor area to 185 square meters, as well as relief of 1.02 meters in height from the maximum permitted height of six meters, to permit a total height of seven, just over seven meters. The subject lands are located on the east side of Six Concession Road ENR to the south cultus. There's a detached single story dwelling on the site and an existing shed. The area of the subject lands is approximately 4,100 square meters with approximately 33 meters of frontage on Sixth Concession and a lot depth of 129 meters. There are residential neighbors to the north and south of the subject lands and farmland to the east and west. There is provincially significant wetland to the east at a distance of 60 metres and a significant woodland at a different distance of 40 metres from the rear boundary of the application site. The purpose of this application is to facilitate the construction of an accessory garage to accommodate vehicles and campers. As noted in the staff report, the proposal would not impact upon the significant woodlands nor upon the unique character of the hamlet area and would accord with both the PPS and official plan. The relief sought in terms of usable floor area and building height for an accessory building in the Hamlet residential zone 
are considered to be appropriate and minor in light of the location, the lot size, and the purpose of the proposed accessory building. The proposal would otherwise conform to the relevant zoning bylaws, and as such, staff recommend this file for approval. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there an agent or applicant present? Okay. Does the committee have anything to ask the planner? Does the applicant have anything to add? No, okay, thank you. Is there anyone present who wishes to speak to this application? Or online? Okay, what are the wishes of the committee? So file number AMPL 2023040, the name of Jacob Fries. In accordance with section 451 of the Planning Act, the requested relief is considered appropriate for the proposed development, minor in nature, and maintains the general intent of the initial plan and the zoning bylaw. All in favor? That's carried. Next up, we have file number ANPL 2023087 in the name of Mike and Amanda Isley. And the planner can give a report, please. Thank you. Through the chair, an application to receive uh, to construct for the construction of an accessory building requiring relief from section 3.2.1.B of the zoning bylaw, which restricts accessory structures. From, uh, from occupying the front yard uh, in order to permit an accessory structure to be wholly within the front yard area. The subject lands are with are located on the southeastern side of Cedar Drive within the resort residential area of Turkey Point. The site measures 864 square meters with a frontage of 12.1 meters and a lot depth of 47.7, sorry, 54.7 meters. There is an existing single story cottage on the lot with an existing lot coverage of 29.9%. There are no existing accessory buildings on the site. The western end of the lot faces onto Cedar Drive and the site backs onto the lake. The existing cottage is set to the rear of the lot with a with a uh, rep garden area. The application seeks relief from section 3.2.1.B of the zoning bylaws, which states that no building shall be located wholly or partially within the required front yard area. As you'll be aware, Turkey Point along with Long Point are somewhat unusual in that the lake lakefront properties tend to be sited towards the rear of the lot with the main garden area to the front of the cottage facing the street. They also tend to be on narrow sites. As such, it is often not possible to position a garage or other accessory structures to the rear of the main vacation home. There is no viable alternative location in this instance for the proposed garage with a second story storage area, and it would not result in harm in terms of the visual interest and cohesiveness of the streetscape, given the prevalence of this form of development in the area. The proposal would meet the intents of the PBS, the official plan, the Lakeshore Special Policy Area Secondary Plan and the Zoning Bylaws, and is reasonable, appropriate, and minor in nature. Staff recommend this file for approval. Okay, thank you. Is there an agent or applicant present? Okay. And does the committee have anything to ask the planner? No. Does the applicant have anything to add? No. Okay. Is there anyone present that wishes to speak to this application? Presently or online? No. Okay. Can I get a word of the wishes of the committee? Then second, if I will. I'll second it too. So, file number AMPL 2023087 in the name of Mike and Amanda Isley. In accordance with Section 45.1 of the Planning Act, the requested relief is considered appropriate for the proposed development, minor in nature, maintains the general intent of the official plan and the zoning bylaw. All in favor? That's carried. Okay, next up we have file number ANPL 2023130. My name is Tyler Cook. Can the planner give a report, please? Thank you. 
Through the chair, an application has been received to construct an accessory building requiring relief of 113.79 square meters from the maximum permitted usable floor area for accessory structures of 100 square meters to permit a total usable floor area of 213.8 square meters. The subject lands are located on the west side of Turkey Point Road within the Hamlet designation and Hamlet residential zone of Greens Corners. The site has an area of 1.18 acres with a 34.6 meter frontage and a lot depth of 170.3 meters. The existing dwelling is located towards the eastern frontage uh, with an existing single car garage to the rear. Uh, this garage is proposed to be demolished. The purpose of this application is to facilitate the construction of a detached accessory building to be used as a garage and a storage space. It would not contain any habitable space, such as an ADU. As noted in the staff report, the proposal would not impact upon the hazard lands to the rear of the site, nor upon the unique character of the Hamlet area and would accord with both the EPS and the official plan. The relief sought in terms of usable floor area for an accessory building in the Hamlet residential zone is considered to be appropriate and minor in light of the location, the lot size, and the purpose of the proposed accessory building. The proposal would otherwise conform to the relevant zoning bylaws, and as such, staff recommend this file for approval. Thank, okay, thank you. Is there an applicant or agent present? Okay. Does the committee have any questions of the planner? No. Do you have anything to add? Does the applicant? No, everything's fine. Okay. Is there anything anyone present that wishes to speak to this application? Presently or online? No. Okay. What are the wishes of the committee? Submit your a seconder, Linda. So file number ANPL 2023-130, the name of Tyler Cook. In accordance with section 45.1 of the Planning Act, the requested relief is considered appropriate for the proposed development, minor in nature, and maintains the general intent of the initial plan and the zoning bylaw. All those in favor? That's carried. Okay, next up we have file number. ANPL 2023-135 in the name of Leslie Elizabeth Isaacs. So the planner can get the report, please. Thank you. Through the chair, an application has been received to reconstruct an existing boathouse to create a larger boathouse with attached garage. Uh, sorry, an attached carport requiring relief of 104 uh, uh, meters from the uh, square meters from the usable permitted floor area for boathouses of 56 square meters to permit a usable floor area of 160.51 square meters, two meters from the maximum height for a boathouse of five meters to permit a height of seven meters, 6.7% from the maximum permitted lot coverage of all accessory structures of 10% to permit a lot coverage of 16.7%, and 68.4 square meters from the maximum permitted usable floor area for all accessory structures of 100 square meters to permit a usable floor area of 168.4 square meters. The subject lands are located at the junction of Clubhouse Road and Reserve Street within the resort residential zone of Turkey Point. The lot has an area of 1,294 square meters with a 1.5 story vacation home with attached garage. Previously, the lot contained a single story boathouse, which has since been demolished. To the rear of the site is a waterway and pro uh, providing access to the existing boat slip of, on the subject land. This application would facilitate the development of a boathouse within uh, with an attached carport. This application seeks levels of relief which are not considered to be minor and the appropriate route to achieving the desired de development is through a zoning bylaw amendment application. The relief of almost triple the permitted usable floor area is significant even if the total number does not appear to be. The bylaws have been put in place based on an appropriate and well-reasoned evidential base and is considered that approving a development which has tripled the permitted usable floor area could not meet the intent of these bylaws. 
The staff report has clearly outlined where the proposal fails to meet the intents of the PPS, the official plan, the Lakeshore special policy area, secondary plans, and the bylaws for both Boathouse and the resort residential area. As such, staff recommend this application for refusal. Thank you. Thank you. Is there an agent or applicant present? Okay. Anything from the committee to the planner? I just have a question for the planning staff. Is the carport um, considered part of the usable floor area? Thank you. Anything else from the committee? Yeah. Why, uh, applicant or agent having to add? Could have brought the mic to you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Bram Van Den Heuvel. I'm one of the owners of Stonecrest Engineer. Sorry, and I've been uh, involved in this file and a few others in Turkey Point, and um, it's been challenging on some of these boathouse projects. Um, just, uh, you know, this committee previously last year and the year before approved two other uh, projects that our company was involved with, one on 125 ordinance, one on 401 Cedar Drive, which were of equivalent size or larger than the, this particular application. Um, our company provided a planning justification report as well for the members of the committee. I think the largest struggle that we're having on a lot of these boathouse applications is just in the way that usable floor area is defined. Um, from experience now and even having talked to the board um, at the at Long Point at the Conservation Authority as well, what we're learning is that uh, the usable floor area for a lot of cottages in Turkey Point, they do not have basements for obvious reasons. You just can't. And so while the definition excludes um, unfinished basements used for storage, uh, there is not really any allocation for, for storage where clients want to store kayaks, uh, you know, bikes, outdoor furniture, furniture et cetera, in their boathouses. And so that's, that's just a definition struggle. Um, another struggle we're seeing is that while garages are exempt in the definition, when you begin combining boathouses with residential accessory structures, there really is not a clear path. There really isn't a clear um, definition on how those structures should be handled. Um, and so um, this is the reason why I feel these numbers are inflated um, and would appear larger than what is more reflective of this you know, uh, structure. Uh, so, for example, if this structure was two separate structures, if we built a boathouse separately and a residential detached structure separately, we would have larger buildings on this property. Um, but when we can find them, we seem to be, um, you know, the hindered, I guess, through the def def definitions in the zoning bylaws. And it's very complex. You know, uh, we put together a chart just as part of the application, right? Just to try and capture everything with all the definitions. And it's not always an easy process, but we're we're making um, improvements on this. And so, you know, I, I wanna point to that extra document that was provided to the, the members of the committee. Um, and I wanna let you know that even in talking to the board of directors at Long Point, we've had approval on 124, 125 ordinance. We just recently got our permits. Um, it is actually just about to start construction. And, and that um, boathouse certainly also was a combined structure um, with boathouse and residential accessory larger than this particular case. Um, so this, these are the reasons as to why I'm asking for approval of this file. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, I'll let the committee ask the questions first. Does the committee have any questions? Linda. I don't have any questions, but just some comments. Do you want those now? Sure. Okay. So reviewing the planning staff report, staff indicated that it meets the intent of the Planning Act in the provincial policy statement. The lot coverage issue, they seem to be okay with the lot coverage. The height of the structure was okay. So the whole issue is the usable floor area. And I tend to agree with the agent that how it's all calculated and um, just the fact that it's a boathouse and 
and then it's a second story on a boathouse that's figured into the usable floor area. Um, because the lots are small, there's nowhere else. Like I, I can relate. I live in Turkey Point and storage is at a premium. <laughs> so if you're building, reconstructing a boathouse, the only way to add more storage is to do it on top of it. Makes sense to me. And um, like I'm, I'm actually going to support the application, but those are my comments. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody else? I have a question. So there was a boathouse on the site. Uh -huh. and yes. If I'm hearing correctly, you're building a much larger boathouse? Yeah, this is similar to the previous ones we've done. Boat sizes are increasing. No, I'm, what I'm asking is how much larger than the previous existing? Um, I, I am going off memory here, but I feel like the increase in boathouse size is not substantial. Yeah, four feet, wi four feet wider. Four feet wider than the existing. Yes, yes. Previous boathouse. Yes, it's okay. um, practically, um, if we looked at the building side by side, uh, it's the definition of usable floor space that's tripping things up. And this is a combo carport slash boathouse. Yeah, it's a covered. That, it's a covered roof extension for to park some vehicles. Yes. And again. Um, that part of the usable floor area is not included. Oh, it currently is, I believe. No, I mean, in the, in the calculation of usable floor space, that carport. In in the calculation of usable floor area for the boathouse, right. it wouldn't be directly calculable. It is within the um, accessory buildings within the law. So there's two sort of sets of things. Yeah. There's one set of bylaws that are covering boathouses. And there's another set that cover accessory buildings, but they're two separate things, so you can't conflate the two. So, um, so yes, as I as I've said in this report, and and as I would just say in general, I'm not as a planner against this development because I'm perfectly well aware that there's a number of these. My concern is that. We have the bylaws in place for a reason, and whatever the justification for needing or requiring larger, we have to, at Committee of Adjustment, look at whether or not something is actually minor and appropriate. And in my, in, in my um, sort of brain, I would suggest three times what the legal limit is, is not minor by definition. I'm not saying that this couldn't be allowed, but it would need to go through a zoning bylaw, not through a minor amendment or minor variance process. So, you know, I, I fully appreciate the limitations and constraints there are in the resort residential area, but that's also why the rules are in place and the laws are in place and the bylaws are in place, is to be able to make an assessment of impact. So, you know, I, I mean, as I say, it's, that's sort of my my two cents worth. In my professional opinion, I do not consider this to be minor. Therefore, it shouldn't be approved via the Committee of Adjustment. It should be referred to for zoning bylaw. If I may okay, respond. Thank you. you can rebut that. Uh, yes, um, it's this is in our justification report. Um, in these instances, when you build your boathouse separate, and you build a separate residential detached structure, you can get up to 150 square meter sort of allowance when we combine these structures. Where there you're you're correct. There is nothing in the zoning bylaws that recognizes these buildings when you start combining them. But I feel it's quite heavy handed to take it all the way back to 56 square meters. Uh, whereas um, I think if 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 I was permitted and if if the definitions were any different, I would exclude the upper storage. I would exclude uh, the garage and we can bring this, I believe, down to something under 100 square meters. And as I previously mentioned, there are three boathouses we were a part of in the last two, three years of this committee approved very similarly uh, with the exact same refusals. So, um, you know, that's that's all I have to bring to the table. but. 
yeah, that that's just my opinion of working through these. So hopefully that helps the members of the committee. I'm happy to answer any questions. OK, thank you. And can you just confirm, is it a carport or a garage? So but it really is just a covered roof extension. So there are there is no enclosed walls. It's all open. So we just pull the roof out. So it's a carport. So it's sort of a carport. Yes. Covered patio, if you will. Sure. Okay. Yes. Anybody else, Lisa? Through the chair, do you have a rough size on what that covered patio is? Yep. Yep. So that we have an idea. Just gotta pull up my drawing here. Sorry. I think it's 16 feet. Um, 16 by 24. 16 feet by 24. Yes. Is that the 24? Is that the width? That's the, the total, width of the building. Correct. Total width of the building? Total width of the, okay. yes. So it's basically. We made it four feet, to border. four feet wider. Yes, okay. than, than right. what it previously was, okay. yes. And we pulled the roof out a bit longer to create a covered roof area. I understand. Yes. Yeah. Here we go, please. Sir. Okay. What are the wishes? Oh, is there, I think we got. Let's the formalities. <laughs> Is there anyone present or wishes to speak to this application either presently or online? What are the wishes of the committee? Um, just um, having reviewed the report too and seeing some of the other samples that were included in the report based on all of that and the fact that basically the only issue was the usable floor area um, I'm going to make a motion to approve the application. Okay. Second to buy. Lisa. Well, file number AMPL 20231358 in the name of Leslie Elizabeth Isaacs. In accordance with section 451 of the Planning Act, the requested relief is considered appropriate for proposed development, minor in nature, maintains the general intent of the official plan. And the zoning bylaw, all those in favor? That is carried. You're welcome. Thank you. Get well soon. Okay. Next up is file number BNPL 2023143 in the name of Russell Blake. And the planner can give the report, please. Thank you. Through the chair, an application has been received to sever a parcel having a frontage of 72 meters, a width of 72 meters, a depth of 83.8 meters, and having an area of 6,228.3 6 square meters or 1.5 acres, and retain a parcel having an area of 57 hectares as the severance of a dwelling made surplus through farm amalgamation. The subject lands are located on the west side of Highway 24, Norfolk Street South, between Linville Road and St. John's Road West. Uh, there's a detached dwelling serving an existing farm, which has become surplus due to farm amalgamation. It is a two-story dwelling with two existing accessory sheds. Behind the subject lands, an existing agricultural building, which does not contain any livestock, which would remain part of the farmland. The house is on an angle relative to the frontage, with the septic tank and bed to the rear. There is another dwelling, 750 North, uh, Norfolk Street South to the immediate south of the subject lands with farmlands to the west and to the north. The site fronts onto Norfolk Street. Uh, geez, um, uh, the, the land to be severed and the lands to be retained are served by wholly separate hydro connection stage. The site was the subject of a previously approved, now lapsed, surplus farm dwelling se uh, severance, BNPL 2021046, which allowed for the severance of the subject dwelling along with approximately 4,000 square meters of land, or one acre. The size of the proposed severance has been increased due to the septic bed not being on the land of the previously approved severance and would overlap into the retained lands. Uh, the applicant has proposed a lot size which exceeds the minimum lot size of 2,000 square meters as stated in the zoning bylaws of Norfolk County. Due to the configuration of the driveway, the dwelling, the location of the accessory structures, um, and the septic bed to the northwest of the dwelling, the minimum size requirement would not allow for either an adequate frontage or be able to accommodate the septic bed within the site, 
in terms of the northern side lot line. The rear lot line is much further back than necessary, but as this formed part of, the, of a previously approved and now lapsed consent, and does not result in a loss of farmable land or impact upon the viability of the retained farmlands. The proposal would meet the intent of both the Planning Act and the Planning Policy Statement. The proposed uh, surplus farm dwelling a severance would not result in any loss of cultivated farmland, whilst it would result in a small loss of pri prime agricultural land, given the siting of existing buildings and the size of the land to the north subject land. It is not farmable with modern equipment. It is a professional opinion of staff that the proposed development meets the overall intent and purpose <laughs> excuse me, of the official plan. The severance of this surplus farm dwelling would not result in any zoning bylaw deficiencies. As such, staff recommend this file for approval. Oh, thank you. Anything from the committee for the plan? Is there an agent or applicant present? Or online. Okay. Uh, what are the wishes of the committee? Oh, is there anyone who wishes to speak to this application for or against? No. What are the wishes of the committee? No. Thank you. Seconded by. Yeah. So file number BMPL 2023143 in the name of Russell Blake. The application is consistent with the provincial policy statement, complies with the policies of the Norfolk County official plan regarding the creation of a lot within an agricultural area, meets the intent of the zoning bylaw. All those in favor? That is carried. Okay, next up is file number BNPL 2023145 in the name of Dan. Ethan Barnes and the planner can give the report, please. Thank you. Through the chair, an application has been received to sever a parcel um, having a frontage of 43.28 meters, a width of 43.28 meters, a depth of 91.97.1 meters, and having an area of 4,202.42 square meters or 1.04 hectare uh, acres and retain a parcel having an area of 32.42 hectares as the severance of a dwelling made surplus through farm amalgamation. The subject lands are located on the east side of Norfolk County Road 23 to the south of Colonel Tablet Road. The land forms part of an existing farm with a two-story dwelling and accessory storage buildings set well back from the road. The house sits in a grassed and wooded area separating two sections of the farm. The area of the subject lands is approximately 38 hectares with approximately 887 meters of frontage on Norfolk County Road 23. A new underground hydro line will disconnect the severed land from the retained land to avoid any intersection of hydro. The applicant has proposed a lot size which exceeds the minimum lot size of 2000 square meters as stated in the zoning bylaws of Norfolk County. However, due to the dwelling being set well back from the frontage and to ensure the existing septic system is within the lot to be severed, the minimum lot area cannot be achieved. Therefore, it is staff's opinion the new lot is limited to a minimum size needed to accommodate the use and will not significantly impact on any existing cultivated land. It is staff's opinion that the proposed application meets the intent of both the Planning Act and the uh, PPS. Whilst the severance will result in a small loss of currently cultivated farmland, it would not be a significant loss, and the farmland would remain well above the 20 hectares considered to be the minimum area for a, vi for a viable farm size. Providing that the hydro and septic system conditions are met, it is the professional opinion of staff that the proposed development meets the overall intent and purposes of the official plan. The severance of this farm dwelling would not result in any zoning bylaw deficiencies, and as such, staff recommend this file for approval. Okay, thank you. Does the committee have anything for the planner? Is there an agent or applicant present? Yes, here. Okay, thank you. Anything to add? Uh, not right now, no. Sorry? Uh, nothing to add. Nothing to add. Okay, thank you. Does the uh, 
committee have anything to ask the applicant or agent? No. Is there anyone present or online that wishes to speak to this application? No. What are the wishes of the committee? Bill moves to approve. Seconded by Linda. Thank you. So file number BNPL 2023145 in the name of Van Kethan Farms Limited. The application is consistent with the provincial policy statement and complies with the policies of the Norfolk County official plan regarding surplus farm dwelling severances within the agricultural area and meets the intent of the zoning bylaw. All those in favor? Uh, it's carried. Okay, next up we have file number BNPL 2023146 in the name of Gun Holdings. And I think you're doing two at the same time on this one. You can go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, the applications BNPL 2023146 and ANPL 2023147. Through the chair, an application has been received to sever a parcel having a frontage of 43 meters, a width of 40 meters, a depth of 60 meters, and having an area of 2,220 2, square meters, or 0 0.55 acres, and retain a parcel having an area of 39.84 hectares as the severance of a dwelling made surplus through farm amalgamation. Uh, there is also a parallel application for a minor variance seeking relief for an exterior side yard setback deficiency of four meters from the exterior side yard of 13 to allow for a total exterior side yard setback of nine meters. The subject lands are located at the corner of Lower Side Road and Second Concession Road ENR Southwest Fairground. The area of the subject lands is approximately 2,220 square meters with the land to be retained having an area of approximately 40 hectares. The land to be severed, lands to be severed are occupied by a single story dwelling and an accessory building for residential purposes. The lands to be retained are occupied by cultivated farmland, significant woodlands and hazard lands. The applicant has proposed a lot size which exceeds the minimum lot size of 2000 square meters as stated in the zoning bylaws of Norfolk County, but this is only by a small amount approximately 220 square meters. Anything less than this would put the existing tree line on the proposed eastern boundary. Tree lines such as this should be clearly one side of a lot line or the other. If the tree line was excluded, the lot area would be deficient. Therefore, it is staff's opinion that the new lot is, is limited to a minimum size needed to accommodate the use and will not significantly impact upon any existing cultivated land. It is staff's opinion that the uh, proposed application meets the intent of the Planning Act, the PPS and the official plan. The severance of the surplus farm dwelling would technically leave the severed lot deficient in terms of the exterior side lot setback. However, Section 3.36 C, the surplus farm dwelling severance properties, grants relief of exterior side yard surplus of exterior side yard for surplus farm ex for existing farmland dwellings. However, the level of relief sought is considered minor, and as such, staff recommend both files for approval. Okay, thank you. Anything from the committee to the planner on either of these? Nothing. Is there an applicant or agent present? Anything to add to either of these? Okay. Is there anyone present that wishes to speak to these either of these applications? Uh, they're online or presently. No. Wishes of the committee on file number BNPL 2023146. Move to approve. Second. Okay. So file number BNPL 2023A146, in the name of gun holdings. The application is consistent with the provincial policy statement, complies with the policies of the Norfolk County official plan regarding the severance of a surplus farm dwelling and meets the intent of the zoning bylaw. All in favor? That is carried. Okay, next up is uh, ANPL 2023147. 
we can approve her in the second place or whatever the wishes are. Linda? Linda and Lisa? We'll file number AMPL 2023147 in the name of gun holdings in accordance with section 451 of the Planning Act. The requested relief is considered appropriate for the proposed development, minor in nature, maintained the general intent of the official plan and the zoning bylaw. All in favor? Ms. Carey. Okay, next up is file number BMPL 2023-142 in the name of David and Carol Logan. And I can get the report, please. Thank you. Through the chair, an application has been received to sever, sever a parcel having no frontage, a width of 16.78 meters, a depth of 626 meters, and having an area of 10,647 square meters or 2.63 acres and retain a parcel having an area of 194,000 square meters as a boundary adjustment. Lands to be added to the existing farmland located immediately adjacent to the west of 281 concession to Townsend with roll number 3360100 with a final lot size of 25.73 acres. Sorry, that should be hectares. Oh no, 10.4 10 hectares, 25.73 acres. The subject lands are located east of the intersection of Highway 24 and Concession 2 Townsend. The area of the subject lands is approximately 50 acres or 20 hectares with approximately 36 meters of frontage on Concession 2 Townsend. The lands to be severed are occupied by two accessory structures. The type of building was not identified in the application submitted. It is the understanding of staff these structures were intended to be built on the lands to benefit, however, encroach on the lands given, i.e. to be retained. The application states a portion of the buildings would be removed to further satisfy any concerns of encroachment. <laughs> Following a site visit, staff sought further information from the applicant on the technical or legal reason for the boundary adjustment and history of the structures affected by the adjustment. The applicant submitted a letter on June 5th of 2023, which is attachment two of the report, outlining the site's history of the site, outlining the history of the site and the purpose of the adjustment. This letter identifies the subject application would have the effect of addressing an encroachment of structures, which due to federal legislation would not be subject to municipal permit requirements and the preservation of an error. Additionally, staff received a document, uh, the Federal Aeronautics Power in Canada 2022, a primer for the Canadian Owners and Pilots Association, and a presentation from the applicant on June 20th, 2022. Planning staff extend their thanks to the applicant for discussing the file and providing additional information, albeit after the file was circulated for review by departmental staff. Recognizing this is new information that is both technical and legal in nature, Staff are recommending a referral to provide additional time to recirculate and review this information and any other documents relative to uh, relevant to the file. So as such, this, the staff are recommending this uh, application for referral. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, anything from the committee? This time. Is there an applicant or agent present? OK, is there? Yeah, you have anything to add? Yeah. So just before you start, I mean, there was a, a PowerPoint that was circulated today to the committee. I don't know if everyone had a chance to, to see it or review it. I guess that's what you're going to speak to, correct? Yes, uh, I'm sorry that we've overwhelmed you a little bit today with information, and we understand that a deferral is being recommended. Yeah. Um, we would like to speak uh, to some of the issues that the initial the report that is before you today. Okay, could just can I get your name for the record? And for the record, it's Colleen Armstrong. Okay. I'm speaking on behalf of David Lee. Okay. Great. So, um. I think the reason that we're looking to speak to 
the committee today is because the initial planning recommendations and some of the questions and information being asked uh, by the planning department um, caused some concern amongst the Logan family. They thought this was a minor adjustment between a father and son before certain lands were sold in order to preserve um, a nice clean line, preserve the existing use of both pieces of land and um, allow uh, for the marketing and sale of the retained lands. Um, the questions and um, requests for information and the rec one of the recommendations, which is requesting or requiring that the retained lands be deemed fully agricultural and abandon the existing um, aviation uses we thought was perhaps a bit of an overreach. And um, when attempts were, the letter that we sent was to bring to the attention that this is mixed use land and not strictly agricultural land. For over 60 years, in fact, going back to post World War II, these lands have been heavily involved in the aviation industry. Um, in 1961, the aerodrome was formally uh, established with the construction of a runway and the subsequent uh, other runways were developed and hangars, that, which are the two buildings that are um, that are in question. That was all done prior to the division of these lands. So it wasn't that a building was built on a property line or crossing a property line. The building was there first and um, when Mr. Uh, I'm going to get the name wrong. David Logan Sr. passed away and he divided the land amongst his family members. Then the property became an encroachment, but it's uh, families living next door to families and it wasn't an issue. So now they want to clean that up. They want to have a nice clean line where Colin and Wendy Logan will be able to retain some necessary parts of the aerodrome should the adjacent lands be sold and also very important to the family is the preservation of the pond at the back of the Severn. So this is why we would like to not have um, the recommendation that only the building portion um, be severed. We wanted it to go straight back past that pond. Uh, the um, grandfather of David Logan and Colin Logan's great grandfather was a conservationist. He really um, took care of his natural ponds. Um, we all know there aren't a lot of natural ponds on farms. This is one of them. And, and with the boundary um, going through the pond to a certain extent, they wanted to move it over to secure that pond and to continue that stewardship. So we thought this was a simple application, but now we find that it has grown into um, a discussion about the legitimacy of the aerodrome, which has been active for 60 years. We're being requested to provide data and information to prove that legitimacy. So I, that becomes a struggle because um, the expectation was that the planning department were aware uh, or would have knowledge of, of the federal regulations. So um, I'm just going to, if you could just go to the portion where we start answering the questions, you have this to review. Um, keep going. Uh, okay, so the pl planning act, and oh, I don't have a copy. I left my copy. That's fine. I, I just wanted to address some of the questions that that have come to to uh, out of this report. So the planning act consideration, first and foremost, we want to be clear to everyone that we do not see this as a strictly agricultural zone property. It is a blend of agricultural and an aerodrome, which is under federal jurisdiction. Um, so. Within the presentation, there is a lot of legal information which was provided to us by the Canadian, the, the legal advisor of the Canadian Owners and Pilots Association of Canada. So they've been through this a lot and, and it is a common thing 
that municipalities and provinces aren't aware of the federal reg regulations. So they depend on members to promote, uh, um, inform and educate committees like yourself. So although I'm not a member of it, they disperse the information to us and ask us to go forward. Okay, so first, first and foremost, these are two small farms. They are not large farms. They do not fall under the 40 hectare um, minimum. So they already don't meet that standard. And after they further will not. So we do not see that as an aggravating factor. The same farmlands that are there now will be there. They won't change their purpose or their use. Okay. okay. Um, they're both mixed use agriculture and aerionics. Both of them have runways on them. Those run, the run, main runway was developed before the separation of the land. So it does currently cross both properties. So, so just before you, I just want to ask a clar clarity on that. So the runways cross both pieces of land. <laughs> what is the total length of the runway? Um, this is more of a curiosity question than really. Uh, just under 1433 feet, I believe. 1400 feet ish. Okay. Yeah. All yeah. right. Yes. So it's a significant long, but there are, there is also that is the east west. So in the presentations you have, if you want a further review, there's also a north south runway, which is just over 900. There's also a taxi runway from the hangars to the main east west, which falls on both properties. And that subject that's right along the line that uh, we've we've requested to move on, on, no, on the give side. So from the hangars to get to the main runway, you need a taxi runway. And so that was why that line to us was a practical use of moving that over, okay? Um, so the adjustment doesn't threaten the current agricultural use. The lands that are currently farmed will continue to be farmed. They've had the same common farmer rent the lands for over 10 years now. We do not propose to change or reduce any agricultural lands. Um, and also it is our intention that the aeronautic uses will not change post. So, and, and there is some legal precedent for this. Uh, the Supreme Court has made decisions that allow, even though the lands separate, the it doesn't change the status of the aerodromes. And aerodromes have been known to go over more than one piece of property. The intention is to market. There, there will be some valuation having an aerodrome to the retained lands because it is harder now to create these types of aerodromes. Because as you may know, as of 2018, the federal government allowed that municipalities and um, provincial governments could intervene on the development of new runways. So. They were allowed in 1960 to do this, but they aren't now. So, of course, if someone wanted to do a new one, they would have to um, come before you. They would have to do circulate uh, amongst their neighbors. I think it's about a three mile or five kilometer radius. Everyone has to say yes. So it's hard to have them develop. So this is something that recreational pilots are looking for, the size of the farm um, and the existence of the runways make the property more valuable okay. in the proposed site. If we can okay. just kind of run through these quickly. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Because I did review that. I think most of the members have yeah. reviewed your presentation. Okay, so so that's kind of, to me, I, I wanted to provide this information. I wanted to provide the legal background for it um, because the family, even though we know you, you may choose to defer it, we do not want to see this being a long dragged out process debate over who has jurisdiction is this agricultural is this property okay let's just get some comment from the planning mm -hmm. staff to that uh thank you yeah through the chair the the main issue that we had when we first reviewed this is that all our records and i'm not saying that our records are always going to be perfect but our records have it as agricultural land within an agricultural designation. So that's what we had to work on. For a boundary adjustment, 
in agricultural lands, there has to be a legal or technical reason for the adjustment. Not because it's convenient, not because it's going to keep a lake or a pond on one side or the other, not because buildings have accidentally somehow encroached over into other land. None of that is relevant. It's is there a legal or a technical reason? So the reason that we tried to get the aerodrome side of things established um, is that once we could find out that, you know, actually, no, this is a long standing mixed use problem, it can make it somehow easier for us sometimes to look at the boundary adjustment. We're not as restricted by this legal and technical description because the current, if you were to just look at it and remove the aerodrome from the equation, there is no legal or technical reason for this adjustment in, in, in sort of the truest sense. Yes, there's convenience for the owners on either side. There's the trying to retain a, a, a proper, you know, actual natural pond in one side or the other, but those aren't legal or technical reasons. So we wouldn't even be necessarily, well, we certainly wouldn't have been preferred. We'd have been recommended for few. Um, so that's why we wanted to try and get this further information as far as the aerodrome and its use and its history on the land so that we can then come back and justify either a um, boundary adjustment as proposed, some amendment to it, whatever, but we, we want to make sure that we fully establish what is happening on that land, if there were ever any official permits and how the provincial versus national government laws in terms of avionics or aerodromes applies in this instance, because it's not something we have come across every day. And so we're just trying to establish that, which is why I think as far as the recommendation for referral, it's not to lay this and make it into a bigger issue than it is. It's actually trying to establish the case to allow it in the first place as far as the boundary adjustment. So that that's pretty much where we came from in terms of sort of the, the planning step. So um, it was trying to actually build up the the legal or technical reason for um, adjustment. OK, so you're. I may um, looking to do a little more research. We're we're looking to recirculate the new to circulate the new information we've received and to the various departments and then also be able to do a little bit of further okay. research because aerodromes are not something we deal with every day. So. Okay. Um, does the committee have any questions? Yeah, yeah. The applicant or agent. Uh, is there anyone present, anyone else present that wishes to speak to this application online or in person? No. OK, I'm going to give you one last crack at it. Um, anything further to add briefly? I think just that and, and I appreciate and I'm sure um, hearing it expressed that way is a little bit better than what we received um, because what we received, in fact, some of the questions even trying to answer them, um, our thoughts were, oh, I know nothing about error. <laughs> and and because because the questions asking, even asking how much land you need to take off in a plane, it depends on what plane it is. So so it very and and I think that the family probably will appreciate that that intent because that's it was hard to interpret through the what we received. Okay. So if I may too, um, you know, we've all received <laughs> further information today. Mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, kind of hard to make a quality decision. And, and I apologize for that um, because we had short timelines as well. Sure. Yeah. But we also did get the report. We don't get the reports, the original reports mm -hmm. until past Friday. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you get the report, then you file on additional information. I can't really make a quality decision. I own a victim. So I think what we'll do is we'll leave it at that panel you know, and um, we have a uh, a recommendation for referral. I'll leave it to the committee to uh, make that decision or make that motion if they so desire. Linda? I just have a question for staff. Um, so the recirculation and everything that's involved, approximately how long do you feel that will take? Not actually sure what I think it's a due process. Yes, so Mr. Chair, uh, since the circulation has already been 
done once. So the staff and department is already aware of this application. Generally, what happens is once a new information comes in, it is uh, staff planning staff's response to pass it to the other staffs who previously provided comments. Mm -hmm. So generally, it takes. I mean, generally, in other cases, we generally take less time than the original time frame. It can be around two weeks for getting back the uh, okay. comments. So it's a possibility you'll have to go the next month or the following. So July is our set. So we're looking at probably the August. Um, that's a, that's about all we can do. So uh, I know it's not the answer you want to hear, but. <laughs> OK, I know I understand that we had that issue. I understand we've had that issue before, but you have to be, you know, we did get all this information today. So what are the wishes of the committee, please? I'll move to refer to refer. Yeah. OK. And a seconder. So uh, file number BNPL 2023142 has been moved by Linda and seconded by Phil to be referred. And all those in favor? That is carried. Tim, you're in favor? That's all. Okay. I'm sorry. Well, that's the pro So we don't have a D for we don't have a reaper in this code. Okay. Thank you. So next up, file number uh, ANPL 2023-111 in the name of Jonathan and Ashley Dynevsky. L. Did I just butcher that one? I'm sorry. <laughs> the planner can give the report, please. <laughs> Thank you. Through the chair, an application has been received seeking relief of 7.5 meters from the rear boundary setback for a rear boundary setback of 1.5 meters to allow for a rear addition to the existing detached dwelling. The subject lands are located southwest of the intersection of Highway 59 and on Second Concession Road STR. The area of the subject lands is approximately 1.56 acres with approximately 30 meters of frontage on Second Concession Road STR. The subject lands are occupied by single detached dwelling, detached garage, barn, and paddock. The effect of this application will be to permit an addition on the existing single detached dwelling. The addition will possess a bathroom, bedroom, and kitchen, however, is understood not to be an additional residential dwelling unit due to shared access. The proposal would meet the overall intent of the Planning Act, the PPS, and the official plan. Staff note that while this addition contains a kitchen, bathroom, bedroom, it does not meet the definition of an ADU because the addition is not self-contained. Staff also note that should this shared access be removed, the use would be considered an attached ADU and therefore subject to any applicable provisions of the bylaw. Staff evaluated the re requested relief of 7.5 meters to the required 9 meters rear yard setback to permit a rear yard setback of 1.5 meters as an addition to the existing single detached dwelling. The justification for this increase, as stated by the application notes, was this was chosen for practical considerations, namely that other potential locations will interfere with existing rooms, bathroom, kitchen, bedroom, the septic system, and the gas lines. Staff have reviewed the site and application and recognized that while this degree of relief is numerically large, there are site specific constraints that should be considered. The existing dwelling is located close to the rear lot line. There is limited space to the eastern interior lot line, and the driveway and barn inhibit the placement to the west and southwest of the dwelling, respectively. Staff note that the concept plan submitted as part of the application did not identify the location of the septic system. Given these site constraints and that the abutting lots are predominantly used for agricultural cultivation, 
staff are of the opinion that the proposed development is minor in nature, desirable for the per uh, uh, for the appropriate use of lands, and that it meets the overall intent and purpose of the zoning bylaw. And staff recommend this well to get rid of it. Okay, thank you. Anything from the committee to the planner? Is there an applicant or agent present? Okay. Anything to add? Okay. Is there anyone that wishes to speak to this application present online or in person? No? Okay. What are the wishes of the committee? Bill moves approval. Seconded by Tim. Thank you. In the case, uh, file number AMPL 2023-111, Jonathan and Ashley Dynevsky. Better the second time around. <laughs> In accordance with section 45-1 of the Planning Act, the request of relief is considered appropriate for the proposed development of minor in nature and maintains a general intent for the official plan and the zoning bylaw. All those in favor? Ms. Carey. Okay. OK, last and certainly not least. Uh, AMPL 2023-154, the name of Bobby Vellanozzi and Michelle Gasson. The planner can give the report, please. Thank you. Through the chair, an application has been received to reconstruct an existing cottage with attached garage, requiring relief of 1.9 meters on the lot frontage, allowing a frontage of 16.909 meters, relief of 3,498 square meters in lot coverage to allow a lot of 502 square meters, 20% in lot coverage uh, to allow a total co lot coverage of 35%, and 5.2 uh, meters in rear yard setback, allowing a total rear yard setback of 3.8 meters. The subject lands, which are through lot, are located at the corners of Woodstock Road, Conductor Road, and Geary Boulevard of Long Point. There is an existing single story vacation home on the site. The site has an area of 502 square meters and a frontage onto Woodstock Road of 16.1 meters. The purpose of this application is to redevelop an existing vacation home to a larger vacation home with an attached garage. The subject application is to facilitate the reconstruction of a vacation home on lands designated resort residential within a current residential use. The lot coverage requested is higher than the top value stated in the Lakeshore Special Policy Area Second Plan, Secondary Plan Community Design Guidelines. Section 5.3 of the Community Design Guidelines refers specifically to development in Long Point. In terms of lot coverage, the zoning bylaws protect undeveloped land for other uses to occur on the lot, such as storm water management, lot grading, amenity space on the subject lot, as well as the larger resort development area, individual on site pro uh, private sewage disposal systems, and replacement area for private sewer, sewer systems. Thus, an appropriate lot coverage must be maintained. A standard 15% lot coverage should be maintained in resort areas. In specific cases, a higher 30% lot coverage may be considered appropriate, such as those properties that back onto a channel. Given the proposed lot coverage would be higher than this highest value, and the site does not back onto a channel, but is on a prominent corner site, the relief sought is not considered to be either appropriate or minor in nature. Given this, it is the professional opinion of staff that the proposed development would not meet the overall intent and purpose of the official plan, the Lakeshore Special Policy Area Secondary Plan, or the Community Design Guidelines. Staff would note that the subject lands permitted to build detached accessory structures possessing up to 10% of lot coverage as a right, in addition to this proposed vacation home, for a potential lot coverage of 45%. There have been a number of vacation homes which have high lot coverages, which have been approved in the past, but on such a prominent site, but few on such a prominent site or which could result in a lot coverage of almost 50%. This is not considered appropriate and the level of relief sought on a small site alongside uh, zoning bylaw deficiencies cannot be considered minor. Such a development should be assessed through a zoning bylaw amendment process and not a minor variance. 
is the professional opinion of staff the proposed development failed to meet the overall intent and purpose of the zoning bylaws, which in part seek to minimize overdevelopment of sites within the resort residential zone. Given the above, whilst the proposal would meet the intents of the PPS, it would fail to meet the intents of the official plan, secondary plans, and the zoning bylaw. As such, staff recommend this file be refused. Thank you. Anything from the committee to the staff? Agent or applicant? Yeah. We might. Okay. So I just want to be clear, you're stating 27%? Well, 29% say, and Mr. Wallace is saying 35%. Did I hear that right? Your report. The the level of relief and lot coverage is they want twenty percent to allow a total coverage of thirty five percent. So that's taken from the application. Okay, period. comment on that, Mr. Ross. Thank you. 
I'm not asking you to do math in your head because yeah. I, I can't do it either. So. <laughs> Would you dispute the 35 percent then? Okay. 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 Let's let's see if the committee has any questions. Just to to just so just my the requirement is 15 percent. That's the requirement as per zoning bylaw. The increase is 20 percent. So the total final coverage is 35 percent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything from the committee? Linda? Not a question, just a comment. Um, you did say that they're not planning on putting any bunkies or any anything else on the property, but that's today. What we approve, you know, five years from now, that can change. So that really isn't a valid argument. <laughs> I was going to ask you how you're out for predicting the weather. <laughs> Last planning staff, is that something we could do? Uh, no, there's no provision in legislation to put conditions onto minor variance applications. Mm -hmm. So they uh, they only go on to consent boundary adjustments, severances. So it's all about going. Okay. Anything else from the committee? So, yeah, if you permit, go ahead, just go go on. to add one thing. Um, so the requirement for residential uh, resort residential zone is 4,000 square meter lot. These are existing lot. Most of them are quite small. It's not even close to 4,000. This one is 500 square meter. It's very small. So from that perspective, when it becomes 35% covered, that is not that can be considered a big, a big building considering the size of the lot, and also comparing the other houses nearby. Uh, I think uh, what Andrew mentioned is. Considering the first test, whether it is considered, be considered as a minor or not, uh, that should be also uh, based on this uh, this context. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Would your client be interested in scaling back their proposal? Any any? Uh, I'm of course not. I'm I got a question for you. How many square feet is the new home? Actual square footage, not the garage, just the house. Okay. Anything else from the committee? 
Okay, so um, is there anyone present? Obviously not, or online that wishes to speak to this application? What are the wishes of the committee? I I feel like this is consistent with what we've been approving and what is happening in both Long Point and Turkey Point. And I'll move to approve. Okay. Seconded by Tim. So file number B and P A and P L. 2023154 in the name of Bobby Valenosi and Michelle Gasson. In accordance with Section 45.1 of the Planning Act, the requested relief is considered appropriate. The proposed development, minor in nature, and does maintain the general intent of the official plan and the zoning bylaw. All those in favor? Aaron? Okay, thank you. Is there uh, any other business? Cody? Hi. Uh, training. So the director yeah, is suggesting right. another training. <laughs> okay. We'll take a. a I have here. some other business too. Okay, so um, for July, we are proposing um, training session prior to the meeting, which is, takes place at five o'clock. Um, so we would meet an hour early um, at four o'clock um, for some additional training. So I will send out a formal invite tomorrow. Okay, is that all right with everybody? It's just additional training for the committee of adjustments members, and I think Trisha had spoken um, about it in the last training session that there would be additional training. Um, so that's what we're proposing. Um, pardon. Terms of reference. Yeah, the terms of reference. <laughs> You'd be out of school. That's right. Yes. Okay, Linda. So I was just going to mention for um, the new members that may not be aware, but back in um, 2019, this committee um, asked. I did. It, I was the chair at the time, and the committee instructed me or asked me to do a deputation to council to make some minor changes in the zoning bylaw. And one of them relates to um, the height of accessory structures in the resort residential zone. And at the time we had asked that the um, 
zoning bylaw be amended to go from five meters to seven meters for accessory structures. And boat houses are listed under accessory structures in the um, resort or in the zoning bylaw. So it was the committee's intention mostly that the boat houses be allowed to go up to seven meters. When the zoning bylaw got updated, um, staff updated the accessory structures, but didn't include boat houses. And so since since that time, I've been advised that because of the terms of reference, this committee isn't an advisory board, so we shouldn't have done that. Um, but and then I I followed up on my own behalf to council, and asked because in the minutes of the council meeting, um, so council meeting dated September third, two thousand and nineteen was where council received my deputation and gave instruction to staff to make those changes. Um, so then I did a follow up to council in the way of a memo. Just highlighting the fact that the boathouse section didn't get updated to seven meters. And. Um, I was I received a correspondence back from Brandon Sloan, which is Brandon still the general manager for. Yeah. Planning and Economic Development, or whatever it's called now, um, that they would look at it at the next uh, zoning bylaw update. Um, so I, I followed up with Brandon a couple times. I have a note that I followed up January of 2022, but I think I followed up actually since then again, and he assures me it's on their books to be reviewed the next zoning bylaw update, but right? who knows when that will be. So anyways, just when we're looking at boat houses in those zones, the committee has already asked for a height increase of up to seven. I just didn't know if we're aware of that. Okay. Getting some reaction from the clerk, maybe she could, um, if you could just come to the mic and this is under other business. So that's why we're it's not on the agenda. We usually do anyway. We usually take care of other business. Thank you, Chair. Just um, yeah, I was looking for the item on the agenda. Let's see it. But if there's an update to the zoning bylaw, that would be a council decision. You know. So completely ultra buyers here. And I'm not sure that the committee recommended that or if an individual deputation recommended that. But we'll wait to hear back from uh, the general manager, Mr. Sloan, and, uh, and follow up with him and ask for an update on that if the committee's interested in an update. But as far as um, Changing that zoning bylaw. Thank you. So well, I understand we'll, that. We'll need just, to be careful. We're waiting on an update. It seems to get yes. bounced around a little bit. Yes. And uh, we just like something more firm as to see that. That's all. More of an information item, I guess. Okay. So that's probably something that um, even your uh, staff support could request that update or a timeline yeah. on the update. But the zoning bylaw that we have now is what you would be dealing with for minor variances, right? We, right? And we realize that. I think. Okay, so, thank you. Linda, go ahead. I just think you misunderstood what I was. Your mic's off. I can clarify with you the sort of the history, and I can tell you where the minutes where council instructed staff. I can give you all the information. So I'm not asking for any changes. I. We're waiting for the zoning bylaw to be updated. So maybe you can you can forward that to the clerk. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Any other business? No. Okay. Well, I have a resolution in front of me that uh, I need a motion to adjourn. And who would like to make that next? <laughs> Tim. And seconded by. I bet you Lisa wants to second that one. It's, and I guess it's all in favor, and it is now 609. 
p.m. Thank you very much. And we'll see you in July.